Hello everyone, this is me Clinton D'Souza with a special broadcast on EFI 2018. Goa 365 will take you across the day 2 of the 49th EFI and show you all the major happenings and small tips and bits from the EFI special from Goa 365. It is called the EFI Zagor. The day too began with visitors, delegates and cinema lovers thronging to attend the movie screenings, master classes in general to celebrate the joy of cinema. It all started with a much talked and debated personality, the legendary Swedish filmmaker Igman Berman. A panel discussion titled Berman Wild at Heart, Master at Craft on the cinema of Igman Berman, chairman of board of Berman Center Foundation and council general Ulrika Sagman discussed and deliberated on the films of the visionary filmmaker and his impact on the audience across the generations. The myth, but also I think it's, you know, like half true, is that it actually triggered a wave of um, uh, people who, having seen this TV series, you know, admitted themselves to, uh, you know, uh, pair treatment and I think, you know, uh, marriage counseling, counseling, marriage, marriage counseling, counseling. Yes. exactly, marriage counseling, and you know it also resulted supposedly in very, in in a higher number of, of divorces because these women, you know, there is a sort of a liberation theme there, in in the series. So this happened too, definitely. So a film leading to a higher divorce rate in Sweden. It's pretty influential, I would say. Uh, well, it would. <laughs> let's let's assess his filmic career. Um, what would you say was his breakthrough film? His first real international success was, of course, uh, um, Smiles of a Summer Night, was it not? Yes. In uh, 1955 or so. That was his first breakthrough, which was sort of nominated at Cannes as well. And, and, and he said in an interview that after that film, Smiles of a Summer Night, he never had to worry about making films. Because another extraordinary thing about him was that his films were not very expensive, so he never had problems making them. And one of the things he said was that he was fortunate that uh, he worked in Sweden and not in the USA, where people were obsessed with the box office. Otherwise, he'd never have been able to make his films. So, uh, after Smiles of a Summer Night, is it true he never had a problem getting funds for his films? He had absolutely no problems. In well, for once, he was speaking the truth here. So <laughs> I can corroborate, although I wasn't even born then. But anyway, um, yeah, that's that's true. And he he, you know, he also, despite uh, the general assumption, was uh, had a lot of humor. He was a very funny guy. So um, he he, well, he has this very. Yeah, well, he's never made very funny films, except for one attempt at a parody of Fellini or something like that. Right? Is that right? Oh, you could. I mean, um, my colleague who is head of the other Bayman Foundation, he he even thinks that uh, um, uh the winter... Uh, what's the English title? Winter... You know, the priest, uh, the lonely priest who starts uh, not believing in uh, God, you know, who, who uh, is doubting God and... Right. Winter Light? Yes, thank uh, you. Yes. The Winter Light. Yes. I suddenly forgot the English title. Yeah. Uh, he even claims, you know, that there is humor there, which if you are very, you know, um, uh, gourmet in terms of humor, you can find. But anyway, uh, he has this funny description of, of how, you know, uh, he uh, he reads in the paper that this uh, film that there is a Swedish film making a huge success in Cannes, and he wonders, oh, what film might that be? Uh, and then, yeah, that's Smiles of a Summer Night. So he had already proposed uh, the script uh, of the Seven Seal to the production company, the big production company where he was employed, <coughs> and they had said, nah, this is way too boring. I mean, who is going to see this 
film, it's not going to happen. But then, of course, after the success, there was much more interest. And his producer comes and says, well, g give me the script and I'll read it. And then Bergman says, but, but you have already read it because you turned it down. <laughs> oh, well, well, maybe I didn't read it so closely after all, so give it to me. <laughs> so anyway, but this is true. And another reason why this is not so amazing or so consequential, which however you choose to look at it, is that Bergman was uh, economical in every sense of the world. That means both in terms of his own creativity, that he would, you know, direct in the theater during winter time, and then with the actors that he found there, or actually built um, an entourage of a certain set of actors who all became famous. Then in the summertime, he would bring them and shoot movies. Yep. But the other kind of um, economical thinking uh, is that he never exceeded his budget. I think it only happened once during his entire career, and that was uh, Fanny and Alexander. Which is his biggest budget film. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so seen see from... It on screen. Yeah, and it's screened here too. The lifetime achievement of Wadi was Dan Waldman, the veteran Israeli filmmaker. He spoke about his life and his passion in creating his magical movies like Oscar winning masterpieces like Ben's biography, Flouch and Hide and Seek. He made a point that the film festival were places where ideas and creativity of budding filmmakers take a flight. On the award he said tongue in cheek that lifetime achievement awards are not retirement awards but motivates him to be more creative. The news. I was overwhelmed, and I really, uh, you know, I. There is something here that everybody speaks about mainstream, you know, mainstream films, and I'm actually an advocate of the fringes. I'm a man who is, uh, you know, I'm saying it's very important to make films which are popular, but I think that if a filmmaker has something which is very important for him to express. And maybe there are, you know, it's like classical music or it's like some maybe literature where you don't have the masses going to see this uh, film. And if something is, is important for you, to still make the film. So I think that if to summarize my, uh, let's say, the films that I've made, my filmography, I think that many of the films are films which are deal with something. Let's say I think I made a film which was the first film in Israel that dealt with old age, old people. My first film took place at an old age home. And then, you know, I dealt with many subjects which are not, uh, you know, mainstream, especially at the time when they were made, which were, let's say, in the 70s. Uh, I made a film about, uh, you know, uh, other th subjects which I dealt with, uh, let's say, prostitutes, uh, you know, uh, uh, gay subjects and, and other subjects. And I think that, uh, Having come to this country, I think the first time I was in Ocean Film Festival in Delhi, and uh, I showed my film there, uh, Ben's biography, which I'm showing here. It's one of the you know I'm showing three of my films that I've made in the past, and uh, there was something. And immediately after that film uh, was shown, I was invited to many cities, and I was in uh, many many cities here in India over the years, and saw many many. Um, films, Indian films, but many times when a journalist comes and speaks to me about Indian cinema and says, uh, what do you think about Indian cinema? I mention names of Indian films and he never saw them. It turns out that, you know, there are lots of very good, serious artists who have something important to say, but they come from Assam or they make something about a certain thing. And people in Chennai or people in uh, Kochi don't, uh, you know, uh, don't know these films. So, and I think that uh, here, really, the, uh, 
you know, mainstream is the important thing, and then you also adopt, you know, certain su successful films, producers are going that direction. So I think that many of the filmmakers, the Indian filmmakers who make these special films are, have the same problem that Israel has, because, you know, in Israel it's very hard for a producer to recoup his investment back because Israel has a population of 8 million people, that's all. And also, you know, the, the, the people uh, are not of one kind, you know, they have different uh, cultural uh, common denominators because you have people coming from Africa, I don't know, Ethiopia, you have people coming from Yemen, you have people, I'm speaking about groups of people who originated in different, and there, you know, there was big migration from Russia. Obviously, the people, you know, if somebody makes a film about uh, Ethiopian Jews, you know, I, I'm not sure that, you know, let's say Russian, uh, w Russians will rush to see it. So it is not only a small country, and okay, and on top of that we have the problem of the language, because uh, not, it's not a problem. But for us, I think, if you are, it's very important to make a film in Hebrew. It's a language that people prayed in Hebrew, people, uh, but, you know, it was not a spoken language. So only maybe late 19th century, people started speaking Hebrew. So you say, I'm making a film now. People are going to speak English because it's easier to sell the film abroad. I'll say, no, it's important for cultural reasons to make it in Hebrew because, you know, Hebrew is a very beautiful language. It's important to keep our, it's the heart of our culture, our language. So I'm saying it's not, it's not simple. And in my films, I think I'm trying to not go with everybody, but saying, you know, and there are many people like me now, I think in Israel, there are more people like that than there were in the late 60s and 70s who say, okay, we have something important to do, even we know it's going to be hard to sell, we know it's not going to be, uh, you know, make millions of dollars, but we, <coughs> and now I'm coming to maybe the last thing that I will say um, about this, that um, it's, it's that the important thing is to be able to continue to work, you know, that you're saying I'm not making a film which nobody will see and it will be the end of my career to find a way, you know, to still do these things which are courageous and different, but still continue to make films. So this is, n is not easy to play these games. So I think if you look at my films, they are not, and I think, I, you know, I'm so honored by getting the prize, the, uh, you know, this Lifetime Achievement Award. It's <coughs> not a prize for, you know, prizes and so on, but I see it as a prize for this, uh, you know, uh, that it doesn't matter, you know, what the reviews are, what, uh, you know, the public thinks. Still find a way, make another film, another film, and uh, not try to make a masterpiece or anything. Just see it as a painter at work, you know, uh, improving his brush strokes. The man who started writing poems at the age of 15 published his first book at 17 and came up with some amazing advertisements that became a trend. He's also known for his movie scripts and songs. Yes, it's none other than the Padma Shri Awardee Prashun Joshi. In an interactive discussion, Prashun stressed on values and difficulties that one faces to be successful in life. Exemplifies a rare breed of creativity and leadership. He's given McCann's work in Asia a distinct cultural edge, making it a powerhouse. Under his leadership, McCann India is today the most awarded agency in the country. From the Grand Prix to goals at Khan, Clio, Spikes, DNAD, as well as the Effectiveness Awards, McCann has won them all. Prasoon has been the Titanium Jury President at Khan and presided over several other national and international juries. He has been designated a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Prasoon has been honored with the Padma Shri, one of the highest civilian awards given by the President of India. A prolific writer-poet, he has authored four books as well. His first at the age of 17. He's also an award-winning song and screenwriter for blockbuster Indian films, which have been awarded nationally. Through his multifaceted intellect, across the fields of advertising, writing, music, and public discourse. He has positively impacted the public consciousness and has emerged as an inspiring social cultural voice that resonates across society. Saying that only nature plays a role in what you write, 
would be unfair to people who are probably not brought up with nature. Because you know, it is it is a heart, it is a state of mind, it is a certain preparedness to write later on. Now, you could be brought up in a confinement. Suppose somebody never stepped out of a place and was, was kept confined to a particular place. There are people who have written about what they felt in that particular milieu. So what plays a role is your sensitivity and your ability to express what you are going through. I was fortunate that I got a lot of metaphors in the form of nature. I was brought up around nature. And that reflects in your work. It's very difficult to say, Pehli Kavita kya, kya hai? Because you know, you keep jotting down a lot of thoughts. But since you know, these days, after people start knowing you, they start, you, start asking you these questions. And if you, nobody knows you, you don't, nobody asks you. But fine, because your poetry is like today. Pehli kaun si aapne likhi thi? Shayad, sab humme se likhte hai, lekin pehli ki talash ne kar thi. Mujhe gaya, interviews ho gaya ke liye, mujhe shayad talash kar ke liye, ki log, mujhe ki pehli kaun si thi, koi impact to hona chahiye us cheez ka. To pehle me se ek, jo mujhe yaad hai, aur jiske liye, I felt I have not been understood. Anubhuti ka dhyotak pan jata hai. Apalak niharna sondhari ko, Anubhuti ka dhyotak pan jata hai. अपलक ही हो जाता है मनुष्य जब करता है आलिंगन नृत्य का अपलक निहारना सौंदर्य को अनुभूति का द्योतक बन जाता है अपलक ही हो जाता है मनुष्य जब करता है आलिंगन नृत्य का तब कौन सी अनुभूति होती है उसे जिससे वो कभी नहीं लौटता सो द मेटाफोर इज यू लुक एट अपलक मीन्स विदाउट ब्लिंकिंग सो वेन यू डोंट ब्लिंक The metaphor is that you have looked at something beautiful, so you don't blink. You keep staring at it. You don't blink when you die. So have you looked at something very beautiful? Is death is so beautiful that you never blink after that? पहले तो confused रहे. I I think I still confused by choice. You don't have to decide very fast, and the, especially the youngsters. They are uh, very restless, and, and, and I can understand the pressure. The society puts the pressure on you, your family puts the pressure on you. And um, in our country, I think where uh, parents really do so much for children for a very long time, I think it's unfair to uh, you know uh, keep them in limbo and keep them in suspension, uh, and that uh, they are really worried. So I can understand the pressure uh, uh, youngster goes through, but. That's something about liminal space. The liminal space is where most, it's the most fertile space. When you're not yet decided, if you're very definitive about your views right to, be, to begin with, I think there is no growth there. Because you've already decided, you're cemented. You're a cemented reality. So I think it's important to try it's important to explore and explore your own realities it's very easy to say okay this is right this is wrong this is what i do this is wrong but it's very difficult to realize the truth and unless it's a anubhut satya it's uh, unless it is a truth which is experienced by you this is not authentic so i would say if you want to write for any creative sort of uh, a profession i think you are in my learning, I, I, I am no teacher, I can just tell you my understanding is that one has to look for an authentic voice. And that's not easy. You will always, uh, you might start emulating others, you will, might start following others because this I tell you, when I came to the uh, film industry, I never imagined that I would write lyrics or songs. And, and I used to write for myself, but um, I never thought that, you know, write for films, and especially in my family, where um, we brought up on classical music and a lot of, uh, you know, literature, right? Film uh, music to sunna bhi bhoat bhoat allowed it. So I never thought I would write, uh, you know, film songs. And I also did not know my vocabulary is the kind of vocabulary which film industry likes. Neil Jagger, Janiman, Janijigar, ye sab nahi khaa I never sort of uh, write, wrote like that. I had very different metaphors. 
have folk poetry in me, so little literature, you know. So to, to, those kind of things were reflecting into my work. So I thought, yeah, this is probably a, for certain time. But when I uh, sort of started writing, I felt, you know, people want this. People like the freshness or, or newness in which I had to offer. We will take a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. State of Jharkhand is the Indian state of focus for this film festival. My team got in touch with the members of the Jharkhand Film Development Corporation. They told us that being in Goa is just amazing and this platform at EFI will promote Jharkhand films to the industry and to the wider audience. We have with us now Mr. Rashid from the Jharkhand Film Development Corporation. First of all, sir, welcome to Goa 365 and a very warm welcome in Goa as well. How do you feel being in Goa and setting up this uh, beautiful pandal over here and also the excitement to see that Jharkhand is the state in focus this year? Actually, uh, this is not my first visit to Goa. I've been a uh, part of uh, Film Bazaar for the last two years. But uh, this is uh, part of IFI as a focus state. That is something new that will uh, give uh, the tourism and uh, filmmaking uh, of Jharkhand a major boost. So we'll showcase the entire uh, film related things and tourism thing to the people, the international national delegates and we'll make them, convince them come to Jharkhand and do shooting as well as for tourism purposes. Uh, tell me one thing, how important was it uh, to show Jharkhand films? I mean the films too across India and also the world. Actually, uh, Jharkhand uh, is was the least known uh, place mm. in terms of shooting filmmaking. Uh, in the last two three years, we have been able to rope in many filmmakers just because of our attractive film policy and the tourism policy. And in the just one year of its coming into force, uh, we had directors like Mahesh Bhatt, Anupam Kher, Konkana Sen coming to Jharkhand. So, uh, showcasing our things at international or national events, so that that acts as a major boost and that uh, attracts the investors also, both national and at international level. Uh, and how do you feel being in Goa and keeping in mind even Goan cinema and uh, collaborating with the Jharkhand cinema? Do you think uh, having a uh, for being in the focus, will it be a helpful advantage kind of in promotion of Jharkhand films? Definitely, definitely, 100%. Goa, since IFI, IFI is the most happening event in the, I mean, Southeast Asia at least, not if not in the world. And being a part of it, that that is it, that itself is a major boost, a major incentive. And we, we look forward to collaborate with all the film industries, all the filmmakers, uh, and we would love to be a part of... Uh, uh, Goa, uh, Goa festival and uh, will invite the Goa filmmakers to Jharkhand also. One Jharkhand film that you are excited to watch at the EFI? A Death in the Ganj. Uh, move, this movie is wonderful. 
a little bit for our viewers about the movie if you can tell yeah it's it's about a, a small uh, uh, anglo indian story about a small uh, village where anglo indian community used to live long time back so how the film uh, develops how a small uh, party that uh, that changes into violent thing and results in something which was unexpected so i, I won't tell you the climax because it's uh, really uh, it will uh, really i mean make the movie less interesting so watch the film the climax is ultimate you love it thank you so much sir and wish you all the best thank you sir no film festival or an event or glamour night is complete without its red carpet and on tuesday at the day too here are some of the celebrities from Indian film fraternity added glamour to it. Here are the glimpses of this red carpet. Now coming to the movies, Karvas, a movie that is being selected by the Indian Panorama will be screened at the Sifi. Karvas, a movie about Asavari, a painter by profession, has lost her child. She is totally frustrated by the condolence visits and withdraws to her ancestral house in the remote Konkan village, which then turns to be a turning point. This movie has been shot in Goa and also produced by Goan producer Madhukar Joshi. I am not basically a theatre person. How I entered in this film that Mr. Aditya Lamari two three years back he has done one short film that Awa Aitaina and somewhat I was associated with him, I was working with him. So I inspired from there. And then while talking, he told me the Karva story, the theme of that. And I liked that. And I thought that why should I not enter in this field and see what happens. But I want to say that I am very glad and as a producer I want to say this is an extraordinary success of the film Kharvas. This was the my first time I am appearing in this. This is the baby born, this of me what I to say and this was my first efforts to <coughs> produce something and in the non-feature film and he gave me the chance of that and I had a confidence regarding the Aditya Jamari because he was so working hard and all these things and so at last we got this in Indian panorama in the non-feature film to to inaugural uh, function that our covers was shown. That's all we have for today in our special broadcast, the Ifi Zagor. I will be back tomorrow with more glamour films and more entertainment from the film festival. Until then, take care, God bless, and keep watching Ifi Zagor only on Goa 365.